Tourism has always been a major part of Florida's legacy, and St. Lucie County is very much part of that tradition. But have you explored all that St. Lucie County has to offer? From professional sporting events to pristine waters and secluded environmental preserves, from marine education centers and museums to diverse cultural festivals, St. Lucie County has something for everyone. So join us as we vacation in our own backyard and send you postcards from home. Welcome to Postcards from Home, a show that highlights St. Lucie County's natural and cultural treasures. I'm your host, Eric Gill, and each month we take a look at some of St. Lucie County's best-known parks, museums, and nature preserves, as well as highlighting some of its best-kept secrets. And on today's show, we're going to be diving into the St. Lucie County Aquarium featuring the Smithsonian Marine Ecosystems exhibit. Located at the foot of the South Causeway Bridge on South Hutchison Island, this 5,200 square foot facility houses more than a half a dozen aquarium displays that accurately reflect the habitats found inside the Indian River Lagoon and surrounding coastal waters. It gives you a chance to see what's underneath the water's surface without getting wet. So let's go inside and meet Bill Hoffman, manager here at the St. Lucie County Aquarium, who tell us more about the county's partnership with the Smithsonian. Well, Bill, thanks so much for taking the time to My sit pleasure. down and talk to me. I know you guys have been busy rebuilding the tank here. And, uh, you know, we've been here before. I mean, you and I, we're neighbors, actually, full disclosure. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is, like, our, I think, our fourth postcard show here at the Aquarium in the 15-plus years that you guys have been in existence. Yeah. But it's really changed a lot over those 15 years because you've been here the whole time, right? Yes, I was here from the beginning. Actually, before the beginning, moved down here to set this up. And uh, when we originally opened, all of our walls were cinder block, and yeah, we had bare, bare bones, and now, yeah, everything is very much alive here in the exhibit, and we've expanded. I think we've filled every corner we can fill here in the exhibit. And behind us is the main exhibit uh, that had to be rebuilt over the last, what, four months, really, uh, over the holidays that we yes. discovered a leak? That was my, our New Year's Day <laughs> present. It was yeah. the tank started leaking a few days before that. And uh, yeah, it's a slow process. You can't rush through it. It, it actually took us two or three weeks to, to even get the tank empty. There was over a ton of sand that we had to take out of here and probably several tons of rocks, including having to use a hoist to get the biggest ones out. So it was a slow process to get it empty. And then once it was emptied, um, we made the repair, which was on the fiberglass bottom of the aquarium. A couple of empty shells had gotten stuck in a pump outflow and literally wore a hole through the bottom of the aquarium. Um, Nature finds a way. Yeah, right? <laughs> it, was, it was amazing actually to see that that happened. Yeah. Uh, but it gave us an opportunity to make some changes and some improvements to the system that we wouldn't have been able to make otherwise. So. And the history behind the, the Smithsonian's partnership with St. Lucie County, this tank originally was in D.C.? Yes, yeah. It originally opened in 1980 in Washington, D.C and um, was the first display of a living Atlantic coral reef habitat. So, and we have a lot of the rocks and the live rock and, and some of the corals that we have here were actually brought down from some of those earlier collections in DC. And so through the leak, we we, serve, we, made, we were able to keep that stuff alive, right? We, we you had temporary storage. I think some stuff went to Florida Ocean Graphic. Yes, we, we, we got rid of all of our larger fishes. We just aren't set up to keep that many things in quarantine and especially bigger fishes in quarantine. So again, it gave us a chance to scale down. And as you can see behind me, there are lots of little fishes that'll have years to grow in the exhibit. And that's one of the cool things I think over the years, bringing my kids to the aquarium, we've seen, you see fish grow up and move from tank to tank. And yeah, that, we do that on, on purpose. You know, one whole hall of our exhibit is dedicated to the Indian River Lagoon, which is a nursery like all estuaries. And so, our, our sort of our philosophy there is to get them while they're small outside so we an inch or smaller is generally and those are the fishes that have just come into the estuary to utilize it as a nursery before they grow up and move on and so we have the same opportunity to do that here we get the little fishes in we put them in the seagrass or the mangroves they get too large for that and in nature they would move towards the ocean and towards bigger structure and habitat like our hard bottom aquarium here so yeah, yeah as you as you mentioned we we are able to move many of them through the exhibit and in the history with the smithsonian how they ended up in st lucie county you you all started back in the 70s here right as a research station yeah the smithsonian marine station has been here in fact originally was on the same property as harbor branch right. and was 
was in managing Harbor Branch when it, back in the very beginning. Um, and, and so, yeah, the Smithsonian, I think, officially started in 1970 with our director, Mary Rice, who came down. And I believe it was 1999 when they moved to the property here on the island and set up their permanent Smithsonian Marine Station. Yeah. And, you, and it's not open to the public, although once or twice a year there is lab days where well, people can get tours. Yeah, there's the open house, which yeah. just happened, happened I think, yeah. a couple of weeks ago. It's the first Thursday in March, typically. Yeah. Um, but also, every the third Thursday right. of every month at 2 o'clock, there is a behind-the-scenes tour mm -hmm. at the research well, okay. station, and that is led by one of the researchers or one of the technicians over there, and it goes lab by lab, so it's kind oh. of a mini version of the open house. Yeah. You still get to meet all the scientists and learn what they're doing. And then you all also host some of the scientists here during, usually January to March, there's always a Wednesday morning lecture yes. here and yeah. some of those researchers. It's called Marine Science in the Morning Yeah, is our morning lecture. So that's an opportunity, too, to hear some of the unique work that's being Yeah, and not just even Smithsonian scientists, but we had a few of Florida Atlantic University scientists. We had the University of Miami so yeah we have a lot of the local there's a lot of marine research in this area and, and we're able to tap into that because we're right at that where the tropics begin right yeah I mean, yeah well that's what I was just telling someone yesterday for example in our in our seagrass tank we are in our local habitats here we find northern puffers we find southern puffers northern hakes and southern hakes so yeah we're right in the middle so and that's probably what makes the Indian River Lagoon the most diverse estuary is that it is we're, we're seeing species from the north and from the south and they're all mingling here in the Indian River Lagoon. Yeah and you mentioned a lot of the exhibits all reflect act, try to accurately reflect the habitats found here and and I remember before talking to you and sometimes people say well there's see there's algae in here but some algae is a natural thing that happens in the environment right? Yes yeah <laughs> it's very important and in fact our our whole the filtration of our exhibit is based on algae as our biological filtration uh, and it's through photosynthetic organisms like phytoplankton, algae, mangroves and seagrasses that good water quality is, is maintained. Um, so we have lots of algae in our aquariums, lots of photosynthesis and to me one of the coolest things that you can see in our seagrass exhibit starts around 10.30 every morning after the lights have been on for a few hours is oxygen being produced. That is photosynthesis in action. You know, we hear about it, it's a mystery, but you can actually see, see the it. oxygen bubbles coming out of, of plants. And then, of course, you know, working through food webs, which is really what we're trying to do here in our captive habitats, um, we have to have lots of herbivores to, to account for, to sure. keep that, that algae in balance. So um, we have learned like sea hares are extremely important for us and, as algae eaters. But yeah, just finding the overall right balance of of uh, algae eaters. To and that's an animal that I, I remember like I think 15 years ago you guys didn't have really here but or maybe I just missed them but it seems like in the last five years now they're in the touch tank. And well you know we, we're constantly learning and striving to do better and to make our more our ecosystems more natural and self-sustaining and sure and so in, in aquariums in general anybody who's had an aquarium probably has had algae problems at one time or another and so one of the things that we're constantly trying to figure out here naturally is what organisms out there are eating the algae that we're having problems with. And can oh, yeah. we bring them into the aquarium and will they eat anything else? Will anything else eat them? Sure. And so sea hares have been a great hmm. discovery for us. And they're such cool looking. Yeah, they look like butterflies mashed with a slug. It's weird. Yeah, it's a giant <laughs> slug. And you're right, the ones that we have here, the best algae eaters, are, they, they can swim. Yeah. In fact, we know when they, they need more algae is when they start to swim, swim around. around. Otherwise, they're just on grazing. the bottom eating algae. Huh. <laughs> Now, in the process of rebuilding this, you know, a lot of the coral will take time to grow, and it's an opportunity, I think, for people to come back and see this over time develop. Oh, yeah. Yes, it is definitely going to be a growing process. I mean, in, in addition to us, you know, continuing to tweak and to move things around and make sure the lights and everything is adjusted, but yeah, all of these corals, it, it took years to get to where we are now. And there were times um, I remember where there was spawning and you guys actually got captured some of that? Yeah, and in, in fact, and it was kind of crushing to me because <laughs> back in August, our staghorn corals spawned in this aquarium the same time they were spawning in nature, which is unprecedented. That has never happened in an aquarium before. Yeah. Uh, and so here, you know, I was really excited about that and looking forward to this coming year and yeah, yeah. collecting and doing more with that. And then this happened. 
so I am not sure our corals will spawn this year. Not, um, yeah. But we have been keeping the temperature, you know, we, we follow the seasonal change in temperature and, and light levels as well. Just like it would in nature. So we have been doing that upstairs. So hopefully we're still where the corals are now. And you do the same thing even in the um, mangrove tank. There is a tide level. Yes, and just like the tide out there, the tide moves up and down. It does. We change the tide a little bit over six hours, yeah. you know, six hours and 20 minutes between high and low. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's pretty much the same as it is outside. Yeah. Now, for folks that want to learn more, you mentioned that there's tours of the uh, the uh, uh, the lab across the street, but you guys do tours here too. Uh, there's uh, feedings and all kinds of. Oh well, yeah, we we have a, every morning we have a 10:30 feeding tour, and then we have another feeding tour. I think it's called a feeding frenzy tour at 2:30. That's their afternoon snack. <laughs> uh, those are the two main tours, and then on Saturdays we have a behind the scenes tour, which actually I'd like to expand it to cover more days a week. Oh. But that's where you come into the lab and you learn what what it takes to model ecosystems. Sure, about the the filtration, the algae filtration, filtration system that you talked and about, simulating and food webs, what and, yeah. what they're eating, yep. and yeah. So yeah. It, I imagine it's a lot of prep work. Because on the education side, you guys host a lot of school. I think you got one coming in today. Uh, school groups, and then even in the summer, you have summer camp programs. Yeah. Both of my kids have been through them. They were they loved them. Summer summers used to be slow for us. I mean, back in the beginning, summers were our slow time of the year, and then of course in the fall early fall but now summers are our busiest I think last summer was our busiest we had our busiest month it was July maybe of last year wow. so summers are really busy now and yes it is all about summer camps yeah, yeah. all of the, of the summer camps yeah. come through here it seems and that's a chance for the kids they do staining right here in the lagoon they collect stuff that you know they get a baby hogfish it may end up in the seagrass oh, tank yeah. and it's a great way to get free labor right yeah no exactly <laughs> I mean we do I, I give our educators a list like yeah, so yeah. we could use a hundred little hermit crabs from the, and it's you know it's great fun for the the camp kids yeah. too to be contributing to it's our not just the kids I enjoy it too <laughs> <laughs> I try to sneak in on some of those days too <laughs> Um, and Bill, speaking about hours, you know, at one point we used to be seven days a week, then we, we went to five, and now we're back to six days a week, but seven during the season, right? January right. through March, we're open those Monday. Most of the time it's though Tuesday through Sundays, uh, 10, 10, to th 10, to 10 to 4, and then Sundays is noon to 4, it's right? It's noon to 4, right. Let's get the hour yeah, there. we're open seven days a week um, from January till through the end of March. March, so that's going to change in yeah. soon. Uh, and then six days a week, yeah. And it's a very nominal fee. It's mission four dollars, four dollars, three dollars for seniors. That's fifty-five and older, and three dollars for children. And then we still offer the it, for those that feel like that's still too much to pay. The first Tuesday of every month is, is free, free day. Yeah, so. It's been free, yes. And I mean, honestly, and I, you know, I always say I'm not a salesman, but sure. but uh, the, our membership is the best deal. If you're going to come here more than a couple of times, uh, I year for sure it is, yeah. it is worth it and like i said because it's always even though uh it's the same tanks every time you come back it's different almost you know, we try we try to change yeah and in fact by state law we're if we're going to release animals we have to release them within 30 days of collecting them okay. so like for example in the seagrass exhibit where we get the the little fishes um, we keep them until they same with true of, of lobsters right now there are five little lobsters in there they're about this big but when they get to be this big uh, i need them this big for <laughs> <laughs> they they start to eat our hermit crabs and we know the population goes down so we cycle them through so yeah and then i noticed the barracuda is getting kind of big there in the tank too he's so. ready to go too. yeah yeah so we're gonna we're getting ready to scale down everything yeah. and release some of our animals now folks uh, want to learn more if they have like a group school group homeschool group or red hat ladies that want to set up a private tour they can do that as well oh yes we do have a, a group rate okay. and can arrange you know a special tour with that, awesome. that group they can uh, call the could number on the screen behind yeah. the scenes yeah could be and, and they also now have a joint ticket too to the regional history center behind us so that helps promote them as well yes and get some traffic over there yeah. the, you guys are front and center so you, you know it's easier yes. to see you yeah. guys they're, they're tucked way back in the behind the bridge yeah Chuck at the front desk does a great job of, of letting people know about the historical museum and the fact that they can get a discounted rate if they go to both facilities yeah great well Bill I know you got a lot to do especially I know you want to touch up some things in I'll here be so jumping in there a little later yes <laughs> a couple of hours all right well I appreciate you taking the time thanks so much oh, my pleasure Eric thank you don't, Don't go anywhere. We're going to take a quick break, but we come back and we're going to talk more with the Smithsonian staff here at the St. Lucie County Aquarium.
welcome back to Postcards from Home. I'm here with Jasmine Fox, who is an educator here at the Smithsonian. Jasmine, thanks so much uh, for taking the time. I know you guys got some school kids in here coming. Yes, so you we do have ready. some. We have kindergartners coming in in just a few oh, minutes. That's so. going to get loud. <laughs> All right. So, but I thought we'd start with the touch tank. I want to see the behind the scenes tours, but you don't do a lot of the maintenance behind the scenes, right? You're more the education side. That's right. Yep. I'm on the education side here. So, running the field trips, special events, working at the touch tank, giving tours. Summer camp Back coming up. up. Summer camp's coming up. Yep. Is it booked yet? It is almost fully booked. So yeah, if anyone wants to join in on Marine Science Summer Camp, we do ages six all the way up to 16. So if there's any budding marine scientists out there, now is the time to contact us and sign up. Because they fill up quick. They fill and up my quick. My kids yep. have done it. Oh my God, this thing's moving. <laughs> um, <laughs> what, what's your favorite thing here in the touch tank? Um, well, I would have to say my favorite thing in here would have to be our cleaner shrimp. We have little peppermint shrimp over here yes. that if you put your finger in, yeah. they'll actually hop on and start picking off any dead skin, anything under your nails. They clean all that off, so that's really cool. And are those found in the lagoon? We do have cleaner shrimp in the lagoon, not this exact not species, that peppermint. but yeah, yeah, we do have cleaner shrimp out there. And there was a big shrimp, like lived like Pepe from the, <laughs> from, uh, the Muppet Show. Where, where yeah, did you go? that one is down at the bottom now. Oh, okay. They have a tendency to jump, so I kind of put that okay, down at the bottom there. Smart. <laughs> but when kids come in here, there's any, even though some of the stuff like the pencil urchins look scary, everything yes. in here is okay to touch. Yes, that is one thing we get a lot. Is that safe to touch, particular with, particularly with the urchins, because a lot of people think that they're venomous which it's true some species are venomous but yeah the the ones that we have in our tank uh -huh. like this pencil, this pencil slate pencil yes. sea urchin here yes. it looks a little bit scary with all those spines but it does not hurt you at all they are completely safe to touch unless you put your knee on it then there's a, other really thin urchins as a diving one time i put my went right through the wetsuit <laughs> that hurts a lot yeah that's true you don't <laughs> want to really step on any yeah. of the urchins even though they're not venomous they're still a little bit spiny so yes. um here in the touch tank it's a safe environment and to you're allowed to touch but just two fingers because yeah, I got chastised the other day. I was like reaching in <laughs> yes. pulling stuff out. I'm sure you've seen Finding Dory in that touch tank scene. We don't want our animals to feel that way. <laughs> so yes we do recommend a two finger gentle touch. And mm -hmm. then you've got some conch. Yep so this one so is this a clean a conch, conch uh, again, in here. I'm going to violate the rules here, so I'll, I'll let you, you do it. But yeah. This one is very cool. A lot of our local people or visitors are familiar with these on restaurant menus, yes. but many of them have never seen the real thing. So yeah, this is our live queen conch. This one's actually probably about 30 years old. Oh wow. They get to be up to 40 years old. And this one was actually grown through aquaculture. However, a, a one, a conch out in nature could get to be this size. Yeah. And I actually, yep. this last summer, uh, snorkeling right off Pepper Park, found a conch. Really? Yes. Wow, that's great. And like 15 feet, yeah. Awesome. I drove down and I, I put him back, <laughs> but you know, because the other people couldn't dive as deep as me. So right, I had to, yeah. You know, but, yeah. And this thing's moving still. Oh, so this, yeah. This, so this is one of my other favorite animals in here. People are really interested and in it. I always these. call it a starfish, but it's starfish, not a starfish. Well, it's a sea star. Yeah, okay. we have, well, educators and marine biologists worldwide have kind of switch the terminology to call it sea star uh -huh. just because it's not actually a fish so True. it can be confusing for people but yeah. you know people do of course refer to it as starfish still but yeah this is the nine-armed sea star I don't know about from your experience but from mine it tends to be the most common species you see out yes. in the Indian River Lagoon um, so yeah a lot of people are surprised they think it's an octopus at first actually because <laughs> of all the yeah. arms yeah, but yeah which you don't have any octopuses here huh? we don't have octopus right now we sometimes do really? oh um, keep octopus. like a teeny tiny yeah, yeah, yeah. baby octopus if one of our researchers comes across one so but they're just, crafty they'll get out like they're, yes. they're tricky yeah they are definitely I've seen escape them in the movie. artists <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was dory. true <laughs> that whole part in finding dory was true <laughs> yeah octopuses are but, definitely but with these sea stars what's weird is their their arms are always different sets because sometimes uh, the pencil urchin will cut their arms off yeah that does happen <laughs> but they sometimes and they do regrow their arms back yeah so if you look at this one here Beautiful. this arm right here is shorter than all the others yes. that one's a little bit shorter too and yeah that's because some kind of predator got to it and ate off a portion of its arm a really cool thing about that though you probably know that they have eyes on the end of each arm. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, they do. I learned something. So they're not eyes that can see as well as we can as humans, but they do sense lightness and light and dark. Um, here on the end, you can see that this one actually grew that eye spot back. That's 
so once the sea star loses its arm, that's the first thing that gets grown back, and then the rest of the arm grows Goes back. in the middle. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. So that always fascinated me. Well, Jasmine, thank you so much for taking the time today. Your hands are all wet, but I'll still shake them anyway. <laughs> Because, like, Bill, you're also my neighbor, too. Yep. So. <laughs> but thanks so much for taking the time. I'm going to go backstage there. and Backstage. Behind, backstage. Backstage. We're going to go behind the tanks and learn more about what it takes to keep this thing going. All right. Great. All right. Thanks Thank so much you. for coming out. No problem. Well, Kate, thanks for taking some time. I know you guys are busy. You got some school groups coming in this morning, and yep. uh, you you were busy cleaning the tanks this morning. Yeah, that's a an every other kind of day deal. It takes a bit of time, but it's definitely worth the clear view of that tank. So. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you do here at the aquarium as one of the aquarists. Um, so I'm an aquarist or a marine technician, um, and I kind of run everything back here. So that includes making sure all the specimens are fed. Yes all the tank windows are clean, all the corals are well taken care of, just basically making sure everything stays alive and well. And it's a seven day a week job, I gotta imagine, right? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it Otherwise is. Otherwise stuff will start to eat each other, probably. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, we have a nice routine. We have a weekend Aquarius too, who works a couple weekends for us. So we still get a break, but it is definitely a labor of love. I'm here more hours than Than you're I paid for, be. probably, yeah. Yeah, so aren't we all? But I see behind me, you've got charts, so everything's, measured out to what they're getting so we're not overfeeding right yeah so it's we kind of judge feedings based on their normal diet and nature how active they are where they're normally found um, also our main rule of thumb is think about what you're feeding and the size of the stomach of the animal and we don't want to feed any more than that because then we're overfeeding it and it doesn't need that much to live sure so. and I imagine one of the biggest challenges is not just feeding but maintaining the right balance of water quality and, you know, it's between temperature and salinity and, I mean, I've never been able to keep betta fish alive, so yeah, I, I don't know how you guys do it. It's constant monitoring. We even have charts hanging everywhere, water quality. There's multiple sheets everywhere. We write down things two, three places. It's constantly monitored, constantly changed. We have, well, right now, because we're in a reconstruction, we have a couple barrels full of salt water. So we're actually limited on her normal amount of salt water. We usually have about 500 gallons to work with. Now we're working with about 100 gallons. So it's been more of a logistical kind of battle, but sure. so far it's working out. And you, how long have you been with Smithsonian? Um, at the aquarium, I've been here about a year and a half. Okay, but um, you were with the ma main station before? Yeah, I worked in the Benthic Ecology Lab for about a year on a long-term monitoring project they had going on. So. And you went to school for marine biology then? Yep, I went to FIT up in Melbourne, Florida okay. Institute of Technology, and majored in marine biology and conservation biology and ecology. Awesome. What's the biggest challenge, you think, uh, running an aquarium this size? I mean, because it's not huge, but you, yeah. with the limited staff, it's still Yeah, it's limited staff, so it's a lot of long hours, but it's, it's a labor of love. I love what I do. I find all of this stuff so interesting that I don't mind spending the extra hours here to just show people how interesting it is. Like all of the stuff that we showcase here, you find in our lagoon. It's right in your backyard. And yeah. that's what we like to show. Yeah. So. And that's one of the things too about this lab window. It, this changes quite a bit because if you guys find something unique that I've, I've seen seahorses, bamboo sharks, yeah. giant hermit crabs. I mean, you've had all kinds of cool stuff in here that may not fit in the other exhibits. Yeah, we like to showcase certain things that may not fit in one of our aquaria or it may be too big for one but we still think it's really cool and these change out so often because we go out collecting so often so we like to keep these for about 30 days and then either put them back in the wild donate yeah. them to another facility is that hard because like you know if i call it a little bamboo shark i think i want to keep this thing i don't, I don't want to let him go <laughs> you know yeah. Um, that or, you know, the lobsters, I may want to grow until they're ready to be eaten. But that's, yeah, you know. it is hard, but then I remember, like, these things, that's what they're used to. So I'm okay putting them back out there. It is kind of like, we like to treat them kind of like pets. We like to take very well care of them. Sure. Like they would be taken care of in the wild. They'd fend for themselves out there. They should do relatively well unless yeah. something happens. So you don't want to spoil them too much here and then... Throw them out there and, yeah. Good luck. So, yeah. yeah. But we, so that's why we, that's why we have model ecosystems. So we simulate natural environments here. So they'll have all of the normal things that they can find usually, whether it be stuff in the sand to eat, stuff on the walls to eat, algae, little crustaceans. We have little amphipods that we add, which are tiny little crustaceans. So yeah. 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 
they're all little microcosms. It's really, I love it. Yeah. Well, okay, thanks so much. I know you guys got a lot to do today, yeah, so I'll let you get back sir. to work. Yeah, no nice problem. Meeting. If you've ever wanted to see what lies beneath the surface of the Indian River Lagoon without getting wet, be sure to visit the St. Lucie County Aquarium featuring the Smithsonian Marine Ecosystems exhibit. Located at 420 Seaway Drive on South Hutchinson Island at the foot of the South Causeway Bridge, the aquarium comes to life with hundreds of plants, fish, crustaceans, and other marine life. The St. Lucie County Aquarium is open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and Sundays from noon to 4 p.m. and on Mondays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. January through March. Admission into the center is $4 for adults and $3 for seniors and children. However, admission is free on the first Tuesday of every month. If you'd like to find out more about the programs here at the St. Lucie County Aquarium, call the staff at 772-462-FISH, that's 3474, or visit the Smithsonian's website at sms.si.edu. That's all the time we have today, but if you'd like to see previous aired episodes of Postcards from Home, visit our YouTube page at youtube slash St. Lucie Gov. I'm your host, Eric Gill. Thanks for watching, and be sure to tune in again next month as we continue to send out Postcards from Home.